So this is a meeting of regenerative practitioners in Europe, and it's a monthly meeting of people who are interested in working at landscape scale. And I'm Isabel Carlyle, and I'm going to be giving a talk about the Devon Donut and how we put a regenerative operating system into something which is essentially a framework. And I'm recording this talk so other people can listen, but alongside this go slides and a blog. And um, I'm also gonna share with everybody the table, uh, the indicator table that we made for our interactive donut. So first of all, let me launch the um, PowerPoint that I pulled out a few minutes back. Just need to get into it. Um, Right, so here we go. Can you see that quite clearly? Yes. Fabulous. So I, I actually created it for a talk that I gave um, some time back, 2021, but it's, um, it still will serve for what we want to do here. Because what I want to do is to talk you through our process. First of all, how did we arrive at um, being the team that was taking on the challenge of making the Devon Donut. And then how did we make the donut? And where are we now? That's essentially what I'm going to talk you through. So this is how we in South Devon define a bioregion. So I'll just let you read that. So we brought our bioregioning heads and the way that we look at systems change to the challenge of the donut. Um, of course, with the understanding that we're completely rooted in place and that donuts are a way to think of an economy that's rooted in place. So it had um, a resonance for us from the very beginning. Although Je my colleague Jane and, uh, and Nick and I had even two years ago or three years ago, I suppose it actually was 2018, we opened up a conversation with a data expert who is at Dundee University because we knew we needed a baseline to work from in the bioregion and we weren't sure which one to choose. We had um, multiple options. We had um, the Thriving Cities Index, which was created in Bristol we had, of course, the SDGs and we had Donut Economics. And we did a whole comparison table, which I can share with anyone who's interested in that. And we stepped back because we couldn't see any of these particular ways of analyzing an economy or an ecology at the same time that really served our purpose. So we kind of parked that for a while. And then I'll come on to um, what happened and why we were pulled back in. But let me first of all locate you in place. So where are we? So we're in South Devon. This is South Devon. South Devon is here. So South Devon is the bump in the leg of England that sticks out southwest into the sea. Once upon a time, it was part of a much bigger bioregion, which encompassed the whole of the English Channel. And um, at the end of the last ice age, of course, the sea levels rose and it all became water. But pre the last ice age, so that's pre about 12,000 years ago, this would have been an enormous valley and men and animals walked across it. So we're part of South Devon. We're part of the Southwest Peninsula. We're also, we think, part of the ch South um, or the Channel Bioregion. So this is um, how we describe our work when we look through the lens of regenerative design. Relationships are absolutely key to what we do. We think they underpin resilience. And we use frameworks to help people see what the potential is. I also want to add in something there that we've come to realize since that, which is that um, active learning is absolutely vital as well. So the ability to, to learn from lived experience, to share that with other people, and then to continue to adapt and evolve. We've got a UK um, bioregional community of practice, which any of you are welcome to join if you're in the UK. And uh, we recently had a meeting at which we 
agreed that one of the crucial things we need to think about now is how we continue to learn and learn in a way that keeps pace with the challenges that we're seeing so that we can adapt because our inability to adapt is what's going to um, to save us or make it impossible for us to continue to flourish. So you all probably know about donut economics. I'm not going to explain this to you. Um, its main power really is that it brings the Stockholm Resilience Centers um, planetary boundaries. So the outer ring of the donut is basically the Stockholm Resilience Center's planetary boundaries. And that's called the ecological ceiling in Kate Rayworth's donut. And then the social foundation is more or less the sustainable development goals although quite a few have been left out. And that's not, not surprising because Kate Rayworth's background was in Oxfam. And so she was very aware of um, the SDGs and was working in different places around the world with um, deprivation and the challenges mm. of, of taking care of ecosystems and thinking about planetary boundaries and how they impacted on local economies. So we started off by making an urban plus rural donut. So many of the donuts around the world today, and you can think of places like Melbourne or Amsterdam or Berlin, are very much focused on cities. Um, we didn't want to do that. In fact, there was a very good reason why we didn't do that. And I hope there's a slide that explains that, but if not, I will. Um, so let me explain that now. So there was an event online in, um, July of 2021, no, 2020, in which, um, which is called Regenerate Devon. And it brought over 500 people from around Devon together online in order to share all the different activities that were happening, all the different projects that were happening in order to pr promote regeneration in Devon. And the people who came, came from a very wide range so they came from um, academia, they came from NGOs, they came from governance, they came from community groups and more. And Kate Raywell sent a short video to that meeting. And um, my colleague Jane and I watched with astonishment as the chat went completely on fire. I've never seen so much um, enthusiasm land in a chat window on Zoom before. So that really made us sit up and think, well, there's something here, there's energy here. What do, how do we work with this energy? We weren't sure we wanted to work with a donut, but clearly people in Devon want to work with a donut. So let's see what we can do. And one of the first things we did, or maybe about, about halfway through our process. So what happened was that, so that was in July, 2020. In October, 2020, um, Jane and I and Nick, the three colleagues in the Bioregional Learning Center put out a call to everyone who'd come to that Regenerate Devon meeting and said, we're starting a whole process and we're going to create a collective that's going to make the process work. We're going to make a donut together. We're in no way setting ourselves up to be the experts in making donuts, but let's just figure it out. And we had our first meeting online in October, 2020 with I think about eight people. And then we held online Zoom meetings every fortnight, which we call Coffee and Donuts. And through those meetings, we went on a whole journey to figure out what was important about Devon in terms of making a donut. So we realized quite fast that we wanted to contextualize what are called the domains. So all these named um, slices of the pie, if you like, or slices of the donut around the outside and the inside of the domains. So everything from waste, to soil health, to political voice, all domains. And we knew from looking at um, Kate Rayworth's book and thinking about Devon, that it wasn't going to be, um, wasn't going to light fires in people if we talked about ocean acidification, for instance. So we changed it to coastal marine health. So we adapted what was there to make it something that was immediate to people locally and that's something that people could really engage with. So these are the domains that we settled on. 
So I won't do a cross check now with Kate Rayworth donut, but you could always do that in the future if you wanted to. And we identify these cross cutting themes which don't really land in a single domain. And at that time, of course, COVID-19 was very um, much at the top of our mind, maybe not quite so much now. But um, the main pillars of Devon's economy are the caring sector. So um, thinking about kind of old people's homes or people on benefits or people who are unwell and need care in the community, all of those things. That's a very big part of Devon's economy. Tourism and agriculture are also very big parts of Devon's economy and don't necessarily land in any single domain. And then we have manufacturing, although not an enormous amount of manufacturing. And then we have specific places. So you could, of course, make a donut which focused on tourism. You could make a donut that focuses on a place like Exeter, for instance. We haven't yet gone down that route, but we may do that. And as well as contextualizing the domains, we contextualize the indicators. So each domain has a, an indicator attached to it. I just want to make absolutely sure that no one else is trying to get in. And I'm hoping that that would, it would flag up if, um, if anyone else tried to get in. Fingers crossed. Anyway. Isabel? Can, yeah? If you want to make me or Paul a co-host, I'm sure the two of us can let anyone else in. Thank you, Kieran. That'd be very helpful. Sure. <laughs> there you are, Kieran, you're a co-host. Thank you. So we contextualize the indicators. So how did we do that? Well, what we did was that we, um, for each domain, imagined um, a range of scenarios that were very uh, alive in Devon within that domain. So this is an example of how we did it for coastal marine health and health and well-being and education. We actually changed some of them, but this is where we started. So we read an article or a research paper, in fact, um, sometime in, I guess it's probably like February, March 2021, as we were in the middle of doing this work, about the fact that bottom trawling by fishing vessels releases as much carbon dioxide per annum as does aviation globally. And so we thought, well, we've got one of the premier fishing harbors in England, right here in South Devon called Brixham. It lands millions of, of pounds worth of fish every year. So why don't we home in on that as the scenario that if we could shift the needle on that particular scenario, um, and we were talking, thinking about keystone indicators that if you could shift the needle on the keystone indicator in that domain, it would actually shift the whole domain. So we thought that might be something to explore. And then health and well-being, we knew that the lack of access to open-ended, low-cost mental health support was a growing problem, um, particularly with COVID, particularly with climate change and young people. So we homed in on that. We wanted to test that one out. And then in education, we knew about the therapeutic and the learning benefits of young people in being taken out into nature and having some kind of guided interaction. And that was how we started to put up these straw indicators and discuss them and test them. And what happened with Coastal Marine Health, just to give you an example, was we invited the harbour master from Brixham Harbour to come to one of our meetings and we tested out with him whether this would work as um, the basis of an indicator for coastal marine health. And he said, I don't think it's going to work because it's, it means you're going to start naming and shaming individual fishing vessels and that's just going to be counterproductive. So why don't you come at it from another angle? Why don't you look at marine protected areas and instead look at how we can increase the number of highly protected marine areas around Devon's coasts? And so that's what we settled on in the end. So obviously, if you take action in one domain, you impact on all the other domains, or if not all the other domains, a lot of the other domains. Um, we still haven't figured out how to make that visible um, digitally, but we do want to do that. We want to find a way which we can kind of move on from the interactive digital donut that some of you may have looked at on the Devon Donut website to understanding what the cascade effect is 
of taking action in a particular domain. And um, I don't think I have a slide for it in this slide deck, but one thing we did do was that we invited, um, there's a whole project going on in Devon, which is about creating a low carbon Devon. And that's run partly by our municipal authority, um, Devon County Council, which covers the whole of the county of Devon and academics at Exeter University and various other organizations. And we invited them to come to one of our coffee and donut sessions. And we said, well, it'd be very interesting to see what happens when we kind of line up the Devon Carbon Plan with the Devon Donut. Why don't you bring one of your projects that you're working on and we'll run it through the donut. And they brought with them a project which is all about electric vehicle charging points. So at that time, they were investing money on um, putting electric vehicle charging points into a lot of the Devon County Council car parks and elsewhere. And um, we said, OK, we'll just kind of put it into the donut and see what comes out the other end. And this was a very, very rapid analysis. It didn't, you know, we didn't go into it in great depth. But in the space of half an hour, what we came up with was that electric vehicle charging, which of course is support, supporting electric vehicles, is um, it's definitely an intermediate technology because you're not winning. The only domain you win in is on um, air quality uh, and pollution. So you're not winning on tires on the roads emitting microplastics. You're not winning in terms of equity and equality because you've got still you've got you know, single use vehicles or single family vehicles, ownership vehicles going down the roads. You're not winning in terms of the ability to dispose of the lithium batteries. You're not winning in terms of um, the manufacture of the cars themselves. And of course, if you're not getting electricity from a renewable source, you're not winning there either. And so that was actually, it was a very a good Oscars come. So it was a very useful, process to have gone through and um, we haven't yet been in touch again with the Devon Carbon Plan people it kind of they were a bit silent after that um, so let me keep on going so one of the innovations that um, the Devon Donut has become known for and other people are interested to know more about is the way in which we imagine twinned indicators creating pathways for action for citizens and policymakers. So one of the things we do at the Bioregional Learning Center, working with systems, is um, this kind of realization, which I'm sure all of, all of us have realized, that it's not enough for top-down action only or bottom-up action only on climate resilience or equity or biodiversity loss or any of these things. We somehow got to find ways to work together. So we decided to insert that into the donut from the very beginning. And in the same way that we um, picked up scenarios, Devon specific scenarios, in order to test them out with um, and beyond when we got the Brixham Harbour Master in to help us test out coastal marine health, we realized it was such a good plan to get um, experts from the ground in Devon to join us for coffee and donuts and to help us think into the most appropriate scenarios that we could pick out for each domain is that we, can, we kept on doing it. So we, we created a whole kind of panel for discussion for food and farming and for income and work and uh, for housing and many other domains. And that's how we ended up with the um, indicators that we finally arrived at for each domain. But anyway, just to backtrack a bit to this slide. So here, this is, um, an imaginary um, slide in the sense that we haven't actually tested this, but we, in order to arrive at some kind of um, understanding of a benchmark for how we would measure shifts in these domains, we wanted to set up boundaries that we could measure from. So for the citizens, it's the proportion of pupils and parents who advocate for more guided interaction in nature in order to improve student mental health we had to have something we would me could measure. And for policymakers, it's a proportion of young people of school age was prescribed by the NHS with time in nature at low or no cost. So simply by doing that, by putting those in place, we could start to imagine what the pathways to action could be. And that's how we started to 
think our way into the um, indicator table that I will show you when I've completed this slide deck presentation. So these were the steps in our process. This is how we arrived at the indicators. So we, first of all, um, as we all do in regenerative design, we thought about the end goal. So the end goal is a space for revitalization. So if you can reimagine the donut, we go back to this slide here. We've got this kind of space between the two ceilings. You've got the ecological ceiling, you've got the social foundation here in the middle. Um, Kate Raveworth doesn't call this it, it the space for revitalization, but that's what we've named it. So we wanted to work into that space. So we want to be able to measure gains arriving in that space. So let me take you back here. So this is where we started from. We knew we wanted to gain on revitalization. So that's our end goal. And the domain is contextualized, so it's place specific. So we're working with place source potential here. We didn't name that at the time, but that was what we were doing effectively. And then the scenarios narratives are also of course place specific and they're created um, with a whole team of people being called in to give us their expertise. And the way in which the collective worked, it, um, it grew over the space of, well, the late 20, 2020, and we worked on it all the way through 2021. So we started with about eight people and it grew to about 180 people. And of course, not everybody showed up for every meeting, but we set the scene for action inquiry. And we, uh, as I said at the very beginning of this talk, we didn't always know exactly what we were doing, but we said, well, let's just ask a question about how we do it and then work into that. And the team that showed up on any particular coffee and donuts day would kind of help us think into that particular question that we were holding, or we'd get a panel of experts together and help, they would help us think it through. So this was kind of, in a sense, co-evolving mutualism. We were learning all the time. We contextualize the indicators. That's what the exploration of scenarios helped us to do. And we knew we need twin thresholds. So each indicator was split into two. Um, and then what we were also working towards was potential outcomes and pathways for action and leverage points. So I'll get to that in a minute. Halfway through our coffee and donut session, so this is probably about June of 2020, we held a lighthearted poll in our Zoom session to try and figure out what people wanted the donut to do. Just kind of checking back in with people to say, are we on the right track? And uh, the top things that came up, as you can see, were narratives and storytelling. So telling stories about what, what we could do and what really worked and then lighting fires all over Devon. So that's really kind of um, showing people what we can do. It's that kind of can-do attitude saying that we can do this. Let's get on and do it. These are all the actions that we could take. Well, we were quite surprised. We thought people might be interested in data comparison or targeting tools, but that didn't come up on the top of the list. So this is our goal. This is a bi-regional learning center goal. It's not necessarily a Devon Donut goal, but as I said at the beginning, we brought our bioregioning and systems thinking and regenerative design hats to making the Devon Donut, which is probably why it has the flavor that it does. But you'll see if you read that, that it's um, entirely based on the notion that relationships are absolutely key to to, to all this work. So let me just leave you a few minutes to, to read that in peace. I'm gonna stop sharing. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share with you the indicator table. So let me just do that.
I can also, of course, put this a link to this in the chat. So you'll have it for later. Can you see that fairly clearly? I'm afraid the writing is a bit small. Let me see if I can get it bigger. Yes, I can. <clears throat> okay, cool. So this is the sum total of all the work that we did on the Devon Donut. Um, we put all the conversations and all the um, decisions that we've made as a collective into this table. So here is the ecological ceiling with all the domains listed on the left-hand side. As we work along from left to right, you've got the contextualized indicator, the twin track measures, and the pathways for action that arise from those twin track measures. So I, land use is something that's very alive at the moment in Devon. So we landed on the indicator, the overall indicator, proportion of sectors or companies, groups or individuals in Devon demonstrating commitment to managing land for nature. Well, how would we measure that? So we've got two, two tracks here. The, um, the citizen track is proportion of houses in residential areas maintaining permeable areas, i.e. not opting for tarmac or paving in their front gardens, but allowing um, water to percolate through, but also, of course, um, different kinds of plants to grow in that, in that earth. And then the, um, the policy making um, metric or way of measuring proportion of farmland lost to house building development and urban encroachment year on year. So as will become clear, the, um, the policy makers are not just sitting in Devon. You know, some of our policy makers who have influence on those particular um, metrics or benchmarks are sitting in Westminster. Some of them aren't even sitting in Westminster. They are um, different kinds of organizations that have influence on planning or influence on highly protected marine areas or whatever it might be. But we did, well, of course, want to try and make it entirely relevant to Devon. And then we ended up with these actions that could be taken. So action by communities, groups work with big estates in Devon to cluster small woods together for linked up ecosystem health with support from the WT and FC. So we've got our um, acronym codes um, spelled out at the very bottom of this document, but the WT is the Woodland Trust and the FC, I think is the Forestry Council or Forestry Commission. And then the policy one is landowners work together to develop a new model for multiple uses for land including woodland and agroecology, navigating national stroke local planning rules. So I won't go through the whole thing, but you can see that this is a huge body of work, which took quite a long time to put together. Some of it we will start to revise. We're not convinced that all our pathways to action are the right pathways to action. So here are the abbreviations spelled out. I'm going to stop sharing that. I'm going to put that link in the chat for you. Right, so that's there and you're very welcome to, um, to have a look and play around. And that is what sits behind the interactive donut on the Devon Donut website, which you can go and look at at your leisure. So the other thing that happened was that Paul and I wrote a blog. And we, um, Paul, this is where you come in. You definitely have got to start contributing to this conversation now. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I gave you everyone the link to the blog in the email I sent around, so you can you can read it. Uh, <clears throat> we really wanted to make the case that the reason for the Devon Donut being different to other donuts is that we put a regenerative design lens on it from the very beginning. And I thought it might be useful for the conversation that comes out of my presentation here is to explore that further and to test it. Like, could we have done more? What could we do next? That would really take it in a more regenerative direction. 
But one thing that Paul and I did do at the end of the blog is we came up with nine principles for a regenerative donor. And there were three categories, agency, potential, metrics, and data. Mm. So Paul, Paul, would you like to say something about that? Yes, uh, thanks, Isabel. Um, <clears throat> So uh, just a few words generally about, um, about the donut. I mean, Kate Rayworth would like it to be a regenerative and redistributive um, um, framework. Um, and she points to nature often, you know, how could cities function as generously as nature does? Um, of course, she's looking at, you know, what's in existence uh, rather, than, rather than potential. So it kind of doesn't quite meet our definition of what um, regenerative is. Uh, and in the metrics that um, Isabel has shared, you'll have probably seen a mixture of paradigms, some of which are arrest disorder, you know, um, fewer bottom trawling days or marine protected areas, or access, you know, more access to mental health support, as well as do good uh, paradigm indicators, which are, for example, moments of interaction with nature. Um, what we've tried to do is to, um, you know, I, I, in, together, but, you know, Isabel has clearly been leading this with the team from the Bioregional Learning Centre, is to elevate the donut to, um, or, or help the donut elevate, if you like, Devon to another level of functioning. And of course, Devon is a massive area, you know, the story of place for Devon is highly complex. Um, Isabel started off by saying it's, you know, we, we are place specific and I've been holding a torch in the whole process, you know, iterating between the energy that there's been for these indicators and so on uh, within the paradigms I just mentioned. Um, between that and uh, the passion for stories and being able to tell um, uh, narratives, as you saw, that was one of the things that people really supported. But we haven't absolutely, we haven't completely kind of expanded that. Really, I would say, Isabel, I think I'm right in saying. Um, and those narratives, which would carry the potential of places that people themselves would identify as places, so that we um, we could look at these indicators, but through the lens of the potential that's carried within those stories, if that makes sense. So that's maybe a less developed part of the uh, part of the donut, I think, at the moment. And we tried to, within the blog that we wrote, try to look at um, some of these principles, uh, which uh, which could enable that you know um, that potential for it to be a regenerative donut. And as it, as Isabel says, you know. Um, because there was such an upswelling of support for the donut to start with, um, going with that makes sense, doesn't it? You're in a system where there's that energy to flow with. Um, so to an extent, people are clearly feeling agency where they see they can do something. You know, they've got a framework which can motivate action. And that, you know, the donut does very well and makes that system very visible, not just um, in terms of the you know, absolute things that we need to change, but the but the linkages between them. And we had a number of um, interactions during these Devon um, donut, you know, coffee um, meetings, where people were able to make those linkages for themselves. And that's really, really inspiring um, and important so that we can see the system is wired as one as one system. And that was very important. So therefore, the agency part of it is, you know, something we really wanted to underline. Um, and of course, that's enhanced by this sense of belonging, which links to the narratives that I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, <clears throat> which again, itself links to this notion, and this was an early idea, but I think a wonderful one about having these uh, keystone indicators that in a sense, you know, tap into um, uh, those nodes in the system where you do get these linkages and there's a lot of traffic through that node that links these different domains of the donut. So, you know, that we thought was a very important part of um, enabling the donut to become regenerative. Um, and, and then the, 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 the metrics themselves, well, 
you know, we, we'll be familiar with this, you know, three level framework of vitality, viability and capacity to evolve. I think those are, um, you know, the, those are important frameworks against which to look at all of the indicators that we've got. So maybe I'll just pause there and um, I've said, you know, quite a lot that will, I'm sure, resonate with you and um, Isabel <laughs> do say if I've not correctly summarized or incompletely summarized, but it'd be great to hear from the group too, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think we've talked at you quite enough. So um, we're going to hand it over to you for questions and observations and Fab, Gil. Yeah, first of all, congratulations Thank for, you. for getting a tool that it's also in Portugal is getting a lot of momentum mm. and, and not go into this uh, arrest disorder paradigm or a bit of do good. We know better whatever and for me there is wisdom in this because as you mentioned uh, also paul there is vitality i mean the wave is there there is energy that you don't need to do a lot of stuff because there is energy pushing the question is how to use it right <laughs> and how to use it not and that's one of the things i've been struggling is as soon as i put my feet into the paradigm of arrest disorder and do good I'm energized. People love then a lot of these new concepts of potential, essence, regeneration, but still, we are still in the mud or in, still in the monoculture or still, and we are talking about having a, a, an improvement, whatever. And, and, and my research is about how really to, to, even we are surfing that wave, how to shift and mm -hmm. and I, I got one 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 feedback you gave also Isabel is about when you spoke with the car electric car industry they saw it and then they're gone so what happened that probably we pushed you pushed too much or or on the side or whatever that didn't create the gap for them to go ah Interestingly, we want to go that way, but we were thinking differently and probably we, the way we were going has a lot of other negative effects. I'm not even going into, well, that goes against our business and we have, I'm going to get rich, whatever. Even on the, on, the, on, the, on the software that people are using, what was missing not to land in them that they would go home and then call the next day and go, Isabel and Paul, I don't know, I'm a bit mad at you because you kind of destroyed our 20 year planning. <laughs> and I'm excited with something that I don't know what, what it is because so, and that has been also my research because it's difficult. Once people, and Carol brings that a lot, what she, she even mentions that when she brings people from arrest disorder and do good, I mean, mainly arrest disorder, to a company that she's working for a long time, people get snapped by the solutions, the best practices with whatever. They go back and because she wants to build capability and we all, all want to build capability, there is no more time for that because they, they, they got the list of okay, now we do composting and now we do this and now we do that and now, and then I presume that what she means is that she has no time for capacity building and, and for them to realize where they are thinking from and with. So she's even, from what I read, she's even afraid of taking people to see regenerative fields in a way because they will see with the eyes of arrest disorder value extraction okay if we communicate that you're going to outweigh our competitors and it's going to be great so go 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 so that that's that's one and, and i brought also the, the the competence and the capabilities how did you manage to design that that so did you felt that this place-based making this potential 
how how did you manage to make people, especially if they are not always coming to the every fourth night, gain awareness that this is a, the kind of a developmental process, more than reaching the best indicator or the best solution or whatever? When did it work? For whom? How was also your field of holding that space? Were you also coming a bit frustrated that you, you just managed to get good indicators, but not good questions? I don't know, just I'd like to, because I want to celebrate what you did and you're really paving the way. It, it's, it's a kind of a incremental with a transformative seed in it because, and from my, my experience is that people tend to appropriate regenerative concepts to their level of thinking and then so now regeneration is the same thing as sustainability, is the same thing as sustaining whatever. So I'd like also to listen a bit from you. And this is my questions. These are all good questions. Um, I'm gonna hand to Paul to um, discuss the business <clears throat> aspect because we're now taking that forward, realizing that um, there's a huge <clears throat> potential. There's a huge <clears throat> potential in working with businesses and giving business roles. So Paul, if you want to tackle that, I will then talk about how we actually kind of facilitated the whole thing. Sure thing, yeah. I just wondered whether others wanted to also pitch in and say maybe uh, build on what you know, Gil was saying so we could have a, a, a kind of holistic view perhaps of what's in the room, but maybe it would help then we could, you know, we could answer different things or address different things together as, as a whole. Would that make sense? Yeah, sure. Could I could I add to that then? Yeah, go on, Tony. Thanks. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think what Gil was saying very resonance resonates very strongly with me, and I, I don't not sure I have the answers either. But um, it is that how do you attract people in? How do you draw people into the excitement of what what the potential is there without them then falling into just um, problem solving? Which is, I think, what to sort of paraphrase, I think what you're saying, um, what's the hook that you can have that gets people engaged in a process that ultimately is, is pretty long term? You know, I mean, it's when you look at it, it's a, it's you know, it's it's a commitment, not a not a sort of a weekend activity. If you're really seriously going to um, to generate uh, that capability within people. Um, so what are the long-term promises you can, or, or opportunities you can sort of present, put in front of people that's enough? You know, what sweeties can you give them there, which will, will, will pull them along, along the route, um, you know, with the hope that there will be even more later on. Um, I mean, I'm engaging in a, in a very early stages. It's a similar one here. Um, so I'm starting out with a process really of trying to listen to, you know, hear what people, just a few, lobbying in a few questions to people and just seeing what they're saying um, and trying to get a sense of that. But also at the same time, writing story of place. I think that's so important. Um, you know, as something you can almost tell around a, around a, a log fire is, is such an appealing uh, and timeless way of, of communicating about who we are and, and why we're in places. Um, so, yeah. And just one final one, one other thing I want. You, you use the word resilient a lot. Um, I've been sort of trying to read some of this anti-fragile um, uh, book, which was uh, Nassim Harib, I think. Um, and he presents... Uh, anti-fragile as a, a sort of furtherance of resilience. And if I interpret it rightly, and it wasn't an, an easy in some ways, it's actually anti-fragile is something that makes something stronger by a series of small knocks. So you learn by failure, um, but a sort of manageable failure. Uh, so it's something like almost uh, a tree becoming stronger through wind being exposed to wind rather than having a stake held it there. And then, it, you know, when you get a really big event, uh, it just blows over. So it's this, you know, uh, it, it, it's how do you, how does a system get better 
through actual small testing knocks. Now, I'm not quite sure, I haven't got my head around quite how that might implicate what we're doing here, but um, it just felt relevant. It is relevant. That's very good. Mm. Anybody else want to add any other thoughts or questions? I was just going to say, I think this probably builds on Gil's point. Is I'm just really, I'm, I'd be really, I'm not entirely. It would be really interesting to understand the relationship with Bioregion and Devon, and like how this process is like funded and kind of um, works. I was just, I was just curious, just how that, like, is this something that has been started and then has been adopted, or is this coming from, like, have you been asked to do this kind of thing? Okay, that's good. Yeah, sure. Oscar, any questions? Anything you'd like us to think into? We can just do one round of questions, then come back and do another round of questions. But mm. um, no, not at the moment. I had some. I arrived late, and then I had some connection problems. Then um, I'm going to try to catch up. That's okay. I've recorded <laughs> it. If anyone wants to watch the recording okay. later. Okay, well, let's just take these um, one by one. So, Paul, do you want to start with business? Yes, uh, I can happily do that. I think um, the, the I wasn't a part of the conversation specifically with the um, electric car um, charging folk, hmm. um, but but I think it's a you know it's a perennial question, isn't it? How to enable the space in which people are kind of usefully disturbed um, <clears throat> and recognize that there is a, a kind of paradigm <clears throat> that if they could step into it, it represents a, <clears throat> a next stage of evolution of their business. It, re it represents a, a deep and searching question that they probably um, are holding, but haven't probably consciously articulated for themselves. So that, <clears throat> I mean, I know that sounds all very theoretical, but that is the process that um, Isabel and I are now holding for business within Devon, um, which is which is really absolutely to do that and to um, and to surface, you know, a lot be alongside them as we would as regenerative practitioners and try to surface within them what are the deeper questions they're holding, you know, about the business and what uh, what would they love to be able to bring to the world. And maybe are wrestling with and trying to make sense of, um, uh, such that that would represent, you know, a further kind of unfolding of their essence um, and the potential of their business to serve the context that they're in. So, I mean, I think that's how we would, uh, we, you know, we are planning to approach business, um, and, and indeed, that's, you know, um, yeah, that that's how we kind of wanting to gather people around their own leadership and to be able to lean into that in some useful way. Um, so the way in which we would kind of, uh, our starting point for that is by um, coming at it, coming at the Devon Donut by saying, um, these domains are not going to shift unless business is also engaged. So businesses yeah. have a key role in shifting those sectors. How can we bring businesses on board sector by sector who yeah. we encourage to be um, champions of regeneration or whatever you might want to call it, but give them a kind of leading role in making change happen in that sector in the same way that we identified keystone indicators and actions for policymakers and citizens to do the same for business. So I can add, add to that, Isabel. Thanks yeah, for that. Thank you. If that's okay. Um, so I think the, 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 the kind of challenge, and this is, I thought you put it beautifully, Gil, the, the, this, <laughs> the vitalizing energy that, that, that the donut releases is something to, um, to be able to surf with. Um, but at the same time, you know, the, the donut is kind of imagining that things could come back into balance. And that notion of sustainability is, is antithetical to complex systems because things aren't in balance. They're in dynamic, you know, equilibrium with each other they're at the edge of chaos and all of that good stuff so we could be colluding with this notion of harmony and balance and so on with business if we, if we overplay that the space for, for vitalization therefore that Isabel was indicating earlier that's the key thing it's the potential 
you know, is saying, look, if we can address these things, uh, we address them within the context of the potential that your uh, business um, can unfold for the systems around it. So, you know, these are, if you like, these indicators on the donor are systemic flags. That's all they are. They're not absolutes. They're flags of whether the system is healthy or not. They're flags which tell us, are we kind of within, you know, are, are we kind of um, operating within a framework that's, that, that's healthy? Um, but they don't tell us about potential. That's the, you know, that's the missing, that's the missing piece. Um, important as they are. So how to, back, basically the developmental process is how to hold this vitality at the same time as, you know, getting people to move towards this new paradigm of thinking, um, this space of revitalization. And also illustrating the impact businesses can have not just on their sector or domain, but actually on the place where they're located as well. So kind of place. Right. Does that answer your question? Gil, have you got anything, any observations you want to add? Yeah, just to mention that from my experience working with uh, one big company, I was fired three times. <laughs> <laughs> because, because it was about more than reaching an end and, and reaching an indicator and reaching whatever, it's a human development process. Yes. And I worked with the, the board uh, of the in, in institution, mm. then I was a lot in direct development. So I learned hard, uh, the new book about Carol Sandford, the importance of indirect development. Although we, we, were, we were working with the strategy of the company. So it was, but still I, I, I found it that working at the strategy level by per se, it still becomes too conceptual. And, and too close to direct development because it's conceptual. One thing mm -hmm. is about mm -hmm. building a new factory or a new product or whatever. And then through that, we bring also the strategy of the company. And, and what, I, what I found is it was hard for me to create the gap because I was hired with this idea that we want to become regenerative, but there is the assumption by the founder that is already regenerative. So it's about everybody else getting it. And that was hard. And what I also got is that within the regenerative development, I didn't have the tools, let's call it frameworks, to work with the being side of it. So there was a lot of sabotage. There was a lot of patterns, individual and collective, that they were undermining the process. Yeah. Like, for example, something very simple. The founder, every time he would get late or something didn't go quite nice, he would take all the blame and it would be about, sorry, I did it again. Sorry, I don't want it. And then he would take the whole space, just excusing and crashing a space of co-creation, for example. And, and that's a personal issue that needs to be. So, yeah, and, and that's one, one of the, the phases. The other one is about him taking a lot of space while talking and presenting. And so every time we're about trying to give, about giving the, the space to another one. And we also brought that to awareness. Okay, have you noticed that for the first three meetings, you take a lot of the space? And he also saw that, but he didn't internalize as a, I really want to change it. It just became as, oh, that's me. And it's about, no, it's about a role you're taking. It's about a position. And, and if it's about regenerative, you need to change your role in the company and your patterns yeah. that probably served very well for the past years, but not now. Because when you do that, you take essence out of people or you don't allow their essence to be expressed, you, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I didn't manage to reach this level of conversation to be aware because of course COVID came, then they got into vitality, energy, mental modes, and then it was, it was hard to work with them. And, 
And the other thing is about that we have, we're gonna have billions of euros now dropping in at the arrest disorder. So a lot of the writing of the proposal needs to meet the arrest disorder uh, calls. And so my thing is about how to say yes for the indicator today and let's reflect about what do indicators serve? Mm -hmm. And then- Just, just one thing to add, Gil, if I may. Uh, we, I did an exercise last weekend. I ran the first module of a <clears throat> regenerative leadership program last weekend, uh, which was really inspiring. One of the main exercises I, I did on the first day was to get people to walk the four paradigms of value and to really embody them, you know, not simply conceptually, but to feel them in their bodies. One, two, three, four, okay? And who knows where else? We're human beings, things keep changing. They could be somewhere else, okay? It's not the end. The last one, someone said, okay, but hang on, you know, I can be in this regenerate life place, but surely at some point I need to, I need to get some value. You know, how do I need to put a value stream in place? So I said, okay, and I didn't line them up as a hierarchy, by the way, I just put, scattered them around the room deliberately. And I said, okay, so look back from where you are now in your body, in this, in this more ego-free space, look back to extract value and look at that. Now, how does it change from how you felt when you were there as compared to how you look from where you are here to there? And that was a big shift. Mm. He felt suddenly this exchange, extract value becomes mutualism. The quality of exchange really changes. Yeah, so, so there's a dialogue and there's an interaction and there's a, you know, that there's a kind of sensitivity and so it changes the frame for extract value to be just for me. I look at the piece of view that simply provides that value to me to something much more mutual. So in, in, we're, we're assuming and how we work with this Devon Donut with business is that people will be where they are. And we are all nested, Every, all of these paradigms are within us. We can default to any one of them, but if we look at from the perspective and vantage point of regenerate life, that's the shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, very good. I'm, I'm curious about the regenerative leadership of, of, of how it goes, of, of how much they are able to then follow up because a part of myself is after the CEO or the founder or whatever even gets it, then it, it needs to build as a culture of the company. Absolutely. Of course. Absolutely. It, has, it raises all kinds of questions. You know, how do we maintain ourselves in this space? That's the yeah. being question, first of all, right? And then the function, okay, so what's the role I need to take for myself in relation to the others that I have in my team such that I can stay in this space? And how do other roles need to shift in order for that to happen? Yeah. And then how does that work in relation to the wider systems that we're nested in, right? So, yeah, the culture builds up as a conversation. And, and now I understand why Carol says, for me to work with you, it's a three-year process at least. It's long. Yeah. yeah. It's long. But the pedagogy is slightly different, right? With, with Regenesis, it's, I found it difficult working simply through the head. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I found it transforming to work through the body. Yes, you're right. right. Yeah. So internalizing the energy frameworks, understanding yeah. them, living them. I completely agree about that. It was that point of, you know, when people crossed from, I said, look, you know, your interest disorder, you know, oh, sorry, do good. Just imagine what it's like being able to do this and, you know, uh, all of these good things. Um, um, to change the world, to put your values in, into operation. And now, okay, when you cross to the next, before you do that, try to occupy that space within your body where you feel that your ego is dissolved. Okay, great. We're going to move on yeah. because there's a segue here. So the next question, how did we facilitate the whole process? How did we keep the energy going? It's very hard to explain that, except that we did keep the energy going. And people came back because they experienced the vitality of the group. And people would kind of drop in and say, I had an awful day at work, but I just wanted to come along to coffee and donuts because I knew it would give me a lift. Yeah. So it was like, <laughs> yeah, 
how did we do it? Well, I, I don't know. I do the facilitation. I always just kind of create a heart space for the facilitation to include everybody in um, and to kind of really focus on that vitality. But I think the way in which we um, prioritize action learning and made this a learning process made it very real and immediate and people wanted to be there. And also as soon as we brought in the the teams of experts. So for each domain, we would have four or five people on the ground in Devon to come and discuss food and farming one week or another week, something else. And I, people loved learning from that. People loved being in that space of sitting with the experts and being able to kind of voice their own dilemmas or ask questions. So that worked very well. Um, of course, there is now a challenge because we stopped coffee and donuts before Christmas, we sent out a survey. We're still digesting the survey. We haven't had coffee and donuts since then. So we need to reignite the energy and we're not quite sure yet how to do that. One thing we might do in order to kind of kickstart the whole thing again is to convene a kind of Devon Donut Summit at some point, which would be a live meeting in Devon over perhaps two days at which we get people from all these different sectors and domains and parts of society to come together you know we imagine about 200 people perhaps kind of representing different things to come together and to look at the Devon Donut and collectively to kind of figure out how we get from here to there so can we create a distributed organization that takes the whole process forward what do we need how do we kind of make the Devon Donut a thing that people want to sign up to we've still got lots of questions as you can hear but I would underline, Isabel, it's your heart space which has held it together. Yeah, I think it did hold it together. Yes. And I'd, I never really reflected on that until people started feeding back, because often you don't get feedback in a situation like that. You don't really quite know what's landing and what isn't landing. Mm. And that was about internalizing, internalizing the mm. regenerative um, energy frameworks. So the next one was about story of place or kind of how important, Tony, that was your point, really, how important it is to tell the story of place. Um, so Paul and I did do that a little bit in the blog that we wrote, telling the story of Devon and saying um, Devon's got a very kind of long track record going back to 1204 and thinking about common pool resource management and how you share resources and how power should not be allowed to dominate and how it's about ordinary people having access to resources. It kind of showed up again in the donut in a kind of, in a surprising way. But Paul, maybe you want to say more about that because story of place is something you're very keen on as well. Yeah, I, um, I think, you know, you, Isabel's done a, a wonderful story of place for one particular part of the county, haven't you? It, it, it's Northwest Plymouth, I think. Yeah. Um, so you've led the way really in this country um, do, doing it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel passionately about it too. I'm doing a, a story of place where we've kind of gone through one iteration of a story of place in our, where, where I live here in Bath in the west of England, close to Tony actually. Um, and it, it's, been a, it's been a really wonderful developmental process because it has, um, through facilitating the kind of stories that people bring of belonging, it's enabled people to um, br bring out their diversities and um, work with their own process. Miguel, you were mentioning the leader that you talked about and how they were kind of dominating the group. You know, when people are appointed to, you know, where, where that kind of behavior is gently uh, pointed to, then it becomes, it can serve the developmental process of the whole. Um, because you know it allows them different kinds of spaces to open up. Anyway, that we've 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 almost held um, the notion that you know what the process of the group is actually a, a fractal of the potential of the place. So how the energy rises within the group is also speaking in some way to the place and its and its history, but also its future potential and how that can unfold. And so, um, you know, the story of place um, vocation that we've come up with is as much about 
um, what we've revealed through um, a process through which people have been able to connect and to understand what the potential of that connection is um, as much as anything else. And so um, um, Isabel and I, you know, we, we had some kind of fun times through the process of, uh, of the turnout, <laughs> sort of imagining what could be the stories that people might uh, might tell about their place, you know, thinking about mother and toddlers, you know, looking at a river where their little toddlers could paddle away and, um, you know, that would be a way in which they could imagine the potential of the place revealing itself more of because if the river were cleaner and they were more confident that it, they could take their toddlers down there, that would increase their quality of the experience of their place. Just kind of playing, if you like, with what, what the potential narratives might be, just as a way of dropping in a sort of stimulus into uh, community conversations about, you know, potential, you know, and what does potential mean? You know, talk to me about potential, but this is what it could look like maybe. And then, you know, people through that new being state can take on different roles, become citizen scientists, be motivated to take samples of the river water, for example, to make sure that, you know, what was being um, promised uh, was being delivered to lobby local authorities and address, you know, so you address both of the, this is where we came up with this dual notion of du dual indicators, where you have authorities local authorities uh, you know with their responsibilities and citizens with their responsibilities as well so you know it's weaving weaving together i think um the yeah. potential into story of place thanks thanks paul I, I was interested because i think the i think you mentioned the geology in the earlier one and i i've got this kieran well <laughs> valid this <laughs> but it seems to me that a sort of meta story that goes on in places that is about, that goes back, you know, millions and millions of hundreds of millions of years, that is the pattern that's embedded there. I mean, for instance, you know, South Devon with the, the huge magmatic intrusion of Dartmoor, it pushed its way up through the whole, you know, the whole of the South of Devon and it dominates the whole landscape. I mean, that's a really powerful sort of story that can can reveal, I think, things about that, that that people see only perhaps in detail. And I'm just wondering how, have you sort of worked at that sort of meta level there that, that goes beyond individuality of time and, and, and place, but is, is actually something, of, you know, something about the whole landscape scale? Well, we have because um, Pamela Mang and Gerald Landsberg came to South Devon in 2016. And together with John Thacker, we taught a course at Schumacher which was about bioregioning by design. And we did story of place for South Devon. But just hearing you describe Dartmoor, I mean, and then thinking about the charter of the forest and what happened with that, it's kind of, it's about power. So kind of Dartmoor is, has an extraordinary power to it. So for those who don't know it, it's, it's a huge granite mass in the middle of our county. And um, it emerged many, many billions of years ago when Devon was actually on the equator. And this kind of magmatic extrusion happened. And it's kind of, um, it's this play with power. How do, you, how do you tap into that power and how do you moderate that power? And I think, um, I don't know if I'm, this is something I'd want to kind of explore more, but I think Devon could be seen as a place where power is made visible and it's contained because it was the people of Devon who petitioned King John in 1204 saying, you can't, you can't say the whole county of Devon is your hunting ground. You've got to retreat to Dartmoor, take your power there. And parts of Dartmoor are still owned by the Prince of Wales. So it's still crown property. Um, but it's like, how do, how do we coexist with power? Something around that would mm -hmm. be interesting to explore. I'm really glad you said that. Um, we, we haven't really had a kind of detailed conversation, have we, about the effort it takes for each place to find its story. Mm. Just as you say, Tony, you know, yeah. you do go quite a long way back. We went back to the kind of glacial last ice age in Bath and looked at the glacial outwash, this great torrent across the south of England that shaped, um, you know, shaped the ter terrain around here. Um, and it kind of ended up with, a, 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 you know, the, a braided river system and so we had one of our, you know, how does the place organize itself? It's called process. 
as channeling inundations, because that echoes down through the visitors that came here, the people who came for the spa waters to our famous spa, um, you know, students, tourists, the festival goers, you know, sports fixture people, come people coming to hear music, lots of torrents of people that are get managed somehow through the city space. So that is the echo of the geology, if you like, of earlier. But Isabel and I, we haven't really talked about it at that level for every individual place. So it was lovely to hear about Dartmoor and of clearly how that must influence the whole system there. Yeah, I think it does. Um, so moving on to anti-fragile, so I think that's incredibly relevant. Um, and I liked, Tony, what you were saying. It's like a tree becoming stronger through being buffeted by the wind. Yeah. And for me, that's an evolutionary learning process. And I think that that is very much, um, it's part of the work that Paul and I are starting to do now. So we're looking at bioregions as a framework of value for regenerative investment and applying that of course to our bioregions, but you could apply it at much bigger scale or smaller scale. And um, that is a learning process. In fact, one of the uh, pieces of work we're going to do is working with a climate physicist from Exeter University who's come up with a really intriguing equation between you know, things that you can measure. So you can measure the biomass of a bioregion and you can in some way equate that to life, although we haven't kind of gone into the qualitative aspects of how flourishing that life is. Mm. And then on the other side of the equation, you've got the ability to learn. So if we say that um, the place where we find ourselves now as humans is um, in a position where change is happening incredibly fast, unless we're able to learn faster than the rate of change, we're not going to be able to adapt. So how do we do that part? So this um, learning and adaptation process is absolutely key. So you've got life on the one hand, which is kind of regenerating itself or not. And then on the other hand, you've got this other way of thinking about the ability of life to regenerate by becoming anti-fragile or learning at the speed that's required or adapting in um, intelligent ways. Yeah, that's beautifully said. And um, I, I would just add that in my TRP, when I've mentioned the word resilience, Joe Glansberg sort of had a visible kind of bodily reaction against it. Uh, because I think in the uh, lexicon of, of Regenesis, resilience is about resistance to change. Whereas the way Isabel is talking about it and the way I think I, I approach it, it's about um, it's about connections and relationships and learning. Uh, and, and the quality of anti-fragility is an emergent property of that process, rather than building you know, barriers or levees against flooding, which is, I think, how Regenesis think about it. I think it's also about almost seeking to test your system, you know, um, managing risk in ways, that, you know, testing it out in small ways that, that, that are not destructive, but just actually add that strength to, yeah. to the process. That's very useful. I think I see that mm -hmm. as part of learning, that there are provocations in learning, like gusts of wind. You know, I, I, I've, you know, we've all experienced those. And it's just interesting, I read the other day that, you know, when they did that biome experiment and, you know, when they got people to live in a kind of model of earth in, in one of the, I can't remember what it was called, but planting trees, they just fell over. They couldn't sustain even their own weight because there was no wind. Mm. So that, I think that was a, yeah, mm. underlines what you said. Yeah, so yes, it's anti silo isn't it? It's, it's, it's exposed things to, um, you know, Perhaps unpredictable risk, but to avoid the you know the catastrophic ca catastrophic um, events that can happen from time to time, which we're finding are happening more and more frequently. You know, sort of massive flooding and things like that. So, um, so it's it, you're actually it's going again to protection. Um, it's exposing the system to that. Um, vagaries of what's going on around um, and also building in more redundancy 
It was very interesting. Uh, there was a, a, a Swedish professor was talking about cities and resilience. And I think this was the moment he said, you know, it's crazy. You know, we're, we're making everything so efficient that, you know, it, it's fragile. It becomes fragile. And you need actually nature is resilient and abundant. You know, that's the way it, it, it manages most systems you know, in, in most ways. So, um, you know, you could say call that generosity as well. Yeah, I like that. Um, can I, can I Oscar. just, and the term resilience, I kind of work a little bit with it. Um, <laughs> you do. Yeah, Organizations for resilience.earth, so you definitely yeah, work with it. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. And we, yeah, we did, um, we, we worked with the, uh, the, the, the regional government of Barcelona with uh, Lorenzo Caleri, that did the, the chair of the urban network, Brazilian urban network, with 400 uh, researchers around the globe uh, on urban resilience, and we we were kind of uh, trying to bring a regenerative perspective on resilience. And you can work the the resilience concept as anything um, from a regenerative perspective. Then when you bring it to a, an operative level it becomes a risk management. And, and then it's simply that, and you don't expect much more than that. It's still a very, a very operational thing and very useful thing, something that uh, it's definitely had been uh, one of the main things that has been working around the, the, the planet for the last decade on resiliency. Uh, but that now it's kind of evolving, no? And Rockefeller, uh, Rockefeller uh, Foundation, it's uh, trying to bring up the value of it uh, by talking a lot about uh, the governance in, into the city and trying to kind of uh, generate in, um, much more interrelationships uh, among the different departments. And that's what, like uh, we were already saying that that was kind of a second cycle, no? Um, not, we, we weren't even putting it at do good, I, I don't remember. Um, there, there was some, we, we were trying to put like uh, four levels in and like showing, trying to show the, the, the regional uh, government of Barcelona with which the difference is like uh, having the risk management at the bottom level, the Rockefeller Foundation approach of in, in, of, uh, in uh, open governance for the the city level, well, their approach on it uh, as a second level. Uh, then we were talking about uh, I'm not it's uh, I'm not remember exactly the the all the points, but on the third level we were defining um, or the do good. I don't remember exactly that one. And the last one was the 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 increasing the adaptability characteristic of your of your system then when you actually look at it from that perspective resilient it doesn't really matter what you define resilience it's, it's how when like because you right you from a regenerative perspective you can bring up the value or lower it down it doesn't even make sense to make a uh, to have a debate on what it's resilience because it depends on the approach that you put uh, resilience into Right, and then when you look resilience from a perspective of a high, a higher value perspective, then it's what you're looking into the system is how can you make this system uh, highly adaptable uh, in any case, yeah. and that's it. Then you have a really regenerative approach to resilience from that perspective. You know what I mean? Yes, that's very good. So, what are the um... Okay, what are the different pieces of adaptability? What, what, what is needed for adaptability? Um, we def I don't remember. We defined seven principles with, with uh -huh. Lorenzo. For, um, uh, but, well, actually by regional resilience because we, we were trying to go farther than urban, but I don't remember and they're only in Catalan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could send you a copy, but you're not going to get it. Um, I'm interested that probably Google, I don't know if you can copy and translate it. Yeah, Google Translate might do Catalan. Yes. Yeah. Send them I to us, Oscar. You. I can send you a copy. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. 
And, and we used the, the eight phases of value adding process from, from Regenesis. Oh, did you? Oh. Mm. It works. Yeah, it's as like uh, we try to find uh, the eight basic patterns of uh, the local administrations that mm. you have to kind of increase value in uh, to to be able to regenerate the institution itself. Like uh, the, in our case, the institution was asking, how can we regenerate uh, the territory? And our answer was like, you cannot regenerate the territory unless you regenerate yourself. And mm -hmm. and then we kind of looked into their patterns in their the local government patterns and and defined the the eight basic patterns related to the eight phases of value adding process and then tell them that there was like these four levels uh, carol sanford's levels that they could go if you're in the first level there you're kind of in risk management and then you keep going up until you go to uh, a real resilience that would be the regenerative level excellent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. okay i think we should do a session on that at some point have one of these meetings focusing on that. Yeah. That'd be brilliant. Yeah. 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 So the last question I've got written down, um, we've got about five minutes left, is the relationship between the bioregion and Devon and what the funding was. So, um, so in Devon, we reckon we've got three bioregions. So one is, one is South Devon, one is North Devon, and one is East Devon. Um, they're not defined as that. People don't talk about them as that. But if you talk to anyone who lives in Devon, they would say, yes, North Devon is its own thing, East Devon is its own thing, and so is South Devon. They just wouldn't call it bioregions. So you know when you're leaving South Devon bioregion, because you go west over the Tamar into Cornwall, that clearly is not South Devon. You go north over the moor, over Dartmoor into North Devon, which has a very different character, different economy, different <clears throat> landscape, different soil type, all sorts of things are different. Then if you go east, you go um, up a huge hill called Halden Hill. And then when you get to the top, you can see the valley of the River X. And the River X is situated in East Devon. It's where our county city is, Exeter. And once you've gone over Halden Hill, you're definitely somewhere different. And I'm not the only one who says that. I keep testing it out with people. Mm. So there are these three bioregions. I... The funding, I, I hope that answered the question. So the funding, we did all the Devon Donut work for free. We weren't funded at all. Uh, we decided just to plunge in. Um, obviously we can't go keep going without funding, but the idea was that we were all volunteers. It was all done by a collective. Um, nobody expected their time to be paid for. We got a tiny bit of funding to make the website. And we got a small amount of funding to make the video on the website, but that was all. And and you could say, you know, we spent a huge amount of time on it. And we didn't get any financial return. Why did we do that? But just the dynamic of it all being volunteer did something very extraordinary to the energy. I think that's partly what kept the energy so high because we all knew we were in this together. We were all on a, on a level. We weren't, no, nobody was above anybody else. We were all figuring it out together. Paul, what would you say you experienced from... What was the impact of us, us all being volunteers? Yeah, I, I, I just echo what you've said, Isabel. I think um, everyone uh, kind of appreciated the diversity of, of perspectives. And I think that was down to your facilitation mm -hmm. of it. Um, there was no sense in which there was a hierarchy. That was important. No one had you know, the, the final answer. Um, and, and and we were really kind of um, committed to finding out about each other. That I think was the the learning piece, um, and it felt like a commitment. It was it wasn't a it wasn't anything I'd I'd ever choose to take out of my diary. It was a you know it was a kind of um, a regular date, and I think that rhythm really helped too. Yeah, we were, you know we had that as a kind of fixed thing. And it felt friendly, just the branding of it, you know, which Jane is so talented at, you know, the yes. coffee and donuts were, you know, very inviting. Yeah. So that yeah. was useful too. So we're nearly at an end. But well, that's, for me, that's been a really 
really helpful getting your questions and pondering them. What would you like to do in future sessions? I can't make the next two, but I hope that Oscar can. Oscar, can you facilitate the sessions in May and June? Is that possible for you? Sure. It'd be great if you could record them. I'd love that because I'm going to miss them. I'm going to be away on holiday. Yeah. Should we hear from people to, to send you reflections from this one? Yeah. It was really, um, it was really interesting to hear, understand the process. I think a lot of the examples that we get are very, like, are not <laughs> very, like, a lot of American ones, and then some, like, more, like, on the continent, mainland European ones. So it's really interesting to have, like, a UK example. And so, like, one thing that I would value would be hearing about Paul's process of, like, making the story of place. Because I've read both stories of place that Isabel and Paul have shared, and I think they're wonderful, and it would be really interesting, Paul, if you wouldn't mind doing a similar session like this. Good yeah. suggestion. Happy to do that. Great. So we've got either May or June sorted, and Oscar could do his value adding process for the municipality for the other one. That would be amazing. Any other requests or ideas before we close? Isabel, what's the date of the next two sessions? Yeah, so it's always the second Tuesday. So let me just give them to you. So Oscar, you'll need to send out a reminder to everybody and a, a Zoom link. So the next one is at 5.30 on the 10th of May, 5.30 UK time. And the one after that is the 14th of June. Again, always at 5.30. Yeah. I can't yeah, make the second one. So you better do the first one. <laughs> Yeah, if, if, if people want that, I mean, Kieran, ask for it. I, I, you know, if that's what other people want to do as well, then I'm very happy to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I got very inspired, both by the dynamic, the vitality, the how you navigate it. And I'm going to also start, I'm fundraising now to launch one to three bioregional regenerative kind of activation program because there, there is a lot of SDGs, there is a lot of initiatives, there is municipalities in transition, there is all of, as you mentioned, a lot of things happening. Yeah. And I would like to prototype, to learn, to, to bring. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be here also to share some of the insights, bring some of my questions <laughs> and hopefully also, <laughs> yeah. So, I'm, I'm on and I'll be here for sure in May and very hopefully in June as well. Okay, fantastic. Great. Then, then if I understood uh, in May, the proposal is that you Paul share the story of place? No, I, I didn't got it. Yeah? Yes. yes. Okay. And then you'd be doing June. I can do June. Okay. Yeah. No yeah. Does that work for you too, Tony? Any thoughts from you about what you'd like? Ooh, I'm sure I'll have them when we finished. <laughs> yeah, as always. <laughs> you can always email them in. Mm. Kieran, feel free to email in as well. Mm. Oh, thank you. I suppose one thing I'm quite curious about, do you have, um, here in Wiltshire, which is in, in sort of central southern England, um, We've got a Wiltshire Climate Alliance. So there's a county-wide climate alliance group, uh, which is basically lots of community organizations, individuals who are particularly interested in, in trying to address climate change. I do you have a similar thing in, in Devon that you're engaging with, or is that? No, funnily that, enough, we don't. We've got the Devon Carbon Plan. Right. And there are lots of... Um, towns and parishes and so on that have declared climate emergencies as well as our cities i haven't come across an organization that pulls it all together in one place it may right. exist but we haven't come across it right i mean this is something i would well uh, i just feel my way with this but the, but the um 
as you can imagine, there's a lot of engineers involved, <laughs> retired engineers, and that always is. <laughs> right. Yeah. Keen except he's not retired, you see. Um, but there's, I, I, do, I do find that um, there is a sort of some people who who are very much solution orientated. Um, and I'd love to try it. I'm just trying to get my head around about bringing what we've been talking about into the whole process mm -hmm. to really open it up. Um, because it, I, it just worries me sometimes, some of the you know, people charging in with these mm -hmm. you know, very tunnel vision yeah. solutions and not thinking of the big picture. So not, not to delay our departure, but just briefly one sentence. Um, Part of the story I could tell is working with a sister organisation, which is the representative body of parish councils, the smaller you know, bodies of political representation mm. that sit around our city. And they're used as a sounding board by the council, the city council, to really to, to, to tune into the system. And they are you know, uh, very much driven by the climate and ecological emergencies but they are also adopting a bioregional frame. So I could say more about that. Great. 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 Well, thank you everybody for coming. That was a very good session. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you for hosting and Paul. And Regarding the link, Isabel, you, you'll share it uh, through email, right? To everybody. I can do. The link to the... Um... The recording. Oh, the link to the recording. Definitely. I'll share. I'll give it to the whole group. I'll ask anyone who wants it to email me because I'm going to have to retransfer it. It's way too big to put on an email. Uh, uh, can't we like upload it somewhere and then people just get the link? Yeah, tell me how to do that. I'm not sure how to do that. Okay, I don't know, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and I'll send you an email. <laughs> Good plan. Okay, we'll do that. Excellent. We'll take care. Great. See, Thanks see very much. Probably in July now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Uh, thanks, Isabel. Bye. -bye.